Welcome to the Build and Inspire podcast. We meet incredible people building amazing things, so you'll be inspired to build what you're passionate about. All right, so thank you for coming on, Jason. I appreciate it. Hey, I'm glad to be here. It's been it's been a while. You're my you're my favorite person uh, that I get to introduce uh, other people to because I love saying Morejon. <laughs> You only practice it like a couple of times, right? Like a few, a few. Yeah. Morejon, morejon, morejon. <laughs> so I got to know, are we drinking? Oh, f- yeah, we are. So I've got, uh, I got a glass. Nice. And then I actually made my first Drizzly purchase the other day. Dri- I don't even uh, know what that is. So Drizzly uh, delivers booze to your house. Ah. And so we're in the, the COVID thing and, uh, uh, I usually don't, I, I usually have a healthy supply of bourbon, but of course I was, I was testing Drizzly cause we have a client where we're putting uh, buy now buttons on their websites. And, um, and so, so people could potentially, if they're yeah. it's available in their Did area, they can, they can buy. And so I was just testing it out and I searched for a bourbon that's hard to come by around here. And, and uh, it, it's one of my clients bourbons, but it's still hard to come by. I don't get free bourbon. Sure. Um, and I found it. So I have a bottle of Weller special nice. reserve and I've got my little Glen Cairn glass. So, yeah, Alrighty. I'm, I'm pouring one right now. That's amazing. I love it. So I didn't have any bourbon, unfortunately, but uh-huh. I'm Cuban. So true to form, I got some Santiago de Cuba rum. Nice. I like I got it. my little glass here. Yeah. So, did, so I, let me tell your, your viewers the story of the Please. glass. So this is a Glen Cairn glass. And a Glen okay. Cairn glass is specially uh, uh, made by Glen Cairn Crystal, originally designed uh, for Supreme whiskeys, and it's got the tapered rim so that when when you let your whiskey breathe a little bit and get that sort of oxygen in there and get the the aromas going, when you hold it to your nose, the aromas come into your nose instead of escaping from a bigger rim. Oh, I love that! Uh, I recently just started learning about the different types of glasses, even for beer. All right, there are some that you want your nose in the glass. Yep. Same thing for bourbon? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the nicer the bourbon, uh, the, the older, the more complex it is, the more you really want to get that, that aroma and nose it a bit. Just like wine. You yeah, know, you just kinda, interesting. Well, ooh, cheers. Getting some, yeah, cheers. Cheers to you. Thanks for you having me on one. the show. Mm. Ah, Thanks for like being that. on. Appreciate it. So, as you know, it's called Build and Inspire. I have okay. people on that. I want to talk about what they're doing, what they've done, what they're going to be doing so we can inspire other people. You know, science proves that if we could inspire people that we could actually have major positive impact on folks. Sure. And I couldn't think of anybody better than yourself. I think you're an author, <laughs> keynote speaker. We got to explain what, what, what the hell is a keynote speaker, really? Yeah. Keynote speaker. <laughs> right, you get paid to talk every once in a while or something? Every now and then, yeah. Right. Yeah. Keynote speaker, you have your own podcast. I do. Dad, bourbon drinker, like mm-hmm. a little bit of everything. <laughs> I do. I do a little bit of everything. So and 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 so my background is I'm a PR guy. Okay. So I went to I went to the journalism school or I went to WVU school for journalism. They did that was that was my graduate degree. My undergraduate oh, okay, from it. Moorhead State University, but I am a West Virginia University graduate. I got a master's in sport management there because I wanted to be. Uh, a PR guy, but a PR guy in college athletics. And eventually I wanted to be an athletic director, but I got so involved in the marketing communications world that eventually, instead of going up the ladder to AD, I went outside of that niche of the industry and went into mainstream marketing PR at an agency. And so uh, I'm a PR guy by trade, but you know, when the whole social media thing happened in the mid two thousands mm-hmm. um, or early two thousands, I was kind of right in this sort of career change out of college athletics, but had been using websites and message boards and things like that for years in the sports world uh, to, you know, basically talk smack with people. But I, I wound up at an agency and all my clients were like, we need somebody to help us with the internet and whatever these blog things are. And <laughs> we need somebody who knows that world. And yeah. so I was in the right place at the right time. And happened to be working with some pretty nice clients who wanted to spend some money on that and, and kind of walked into this opportunity to establish some thought leadership and some expertise in even regulated industries, which yeah. there weren't many people doing that at the time. So that's kind of how I got to be who I am, I guess. 
Interesting. So you said a regulated industry, but most of your clients kind of like liquor clients, CPG, obviously that's not regulated, but. Yeah, so the in, at the at the time we were I was working with uh, a, a Beam Global Spirits and Wine, which is Jim Beam, Maker's Mark, Knob Creek, a lot of bourbons, obviously, because Kentucky is where bourbons are for sure. the most part. Um, and so that was regulated. But then I was also doing some things for healthcare. I was doing some things for the financial services industry, and I'm talking you know 2005, 2006. So this is before a lot of brands were jumping into social media at all. Wow. Yeah. And so I don't think I was like. Uh, you know, one of the pioneers of social media marketing for brands, but I was probably on that second wave okay. of people that started, you know, getting into ad agencies and some brands who were, you know, trying to be a little bit more bleeding edge. And, um, you know, we were doing stuff in the spirits industry with Maker's Mark and Jim Beam and whatnot that nobody did for four or five years after we did it. Wow. Um, and so we were kind of blazing a trail there. And the first time I got invited to speak anywhere, it was because you understand how to do social media with within regulated industries. And it was true. I had spent days, you know, it locked in boardrooms arguing with lawyers about what we can <laughs> say on Twitter. You know? Yeah. So you can't retweet. I, I kinda, That's not allowed. I, yeah. I kind of knew how to do it. And, and, and so that was the first area of expertise that I had that other people didn't, that people started saying, Hey, come talk to us about this. Interesting. Now, did you jump at the opportunity to speak or was it like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that? Or? Oh, shit. Yeah, man. I'm a ham. I love being in front of an <laughs> audience. And, and that goes back to, I mean, hell, I was in theater in high school and whatnot. So anytime I have the opportunity to, you know, get up and, you know, show off and tell some jokes and, and you know, and be helpful to people. That's the ultimate mm -hmm. goal is to make sure that I'm sharing knowledge that they can use. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm the guy who at, at a, a cocktail party or at a social event, I'm propping up the end of the bar and there's five or six people around me listening to my stories. That's awesome. So getting up on stage was just, it's a natural extension of that. That's, that's awesome. And then obviously you continue speaking to this day. Yeah. I mean, it, it, at first it was just an opportunity to get, you know, Doe Anderson, the agency that I worked for at the time to kind of get them in front of other people and, you know, get some new business in the door. And yeah. we, you know, got a few new clients because I was out there and visible and doing this social media thing. I, I joked there for a while that I was the, I was the closer for new business pitches because mm -hmm. we go in <laughs> with this fantastic creative and this amazing strategy. And the, you know, the prospective client would be sitting there nodding and then I'd get up at the end and go, Twitter. Ooh. Yeah. 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 And they go, ooh, so where, where do we sign? You know? Yeah. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> so but that was a long, yeah, that was a long time ago. Things have definitely yeah, changed. Yeah. Much harder now. Yeah, it is. But, um, but yeah, I, I started speaking just to get exposure for clients, but then, you know, I ended up writing a couple of books and promoting books means you got to get out there on the road and yeah. know, pitch, pitch the idea and sell books. And so, um, after a while I realized, Oh, people will pay me to speak. Holy crap. That's yeah, amazing. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. a, that's awesome. So I'm probably not, you know, at the, I'm not at the high end of, of, of speaker scale or anything like that. Sure. I do it every now and then mostly for fun. Yeah. but also to make a little extra money here and there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's a lot of fun. I enjoy doing it and I'm writing a new book. So I'm probably going to be yep. out there doing it again soon, whenever we can get back to doing those sorts of things. But yeah, I get a kick out of it. That's amazing. So obviously you mentioned books. I think your first book I looked up was 2011, 2012. Yeah. 2011 was no bullshit social media. No bullshit. I'm, I'm, I probably have a copy of it somewhere. Um, and uh, I wrote that with Eric Deckers and that yep. was really the first book that was focused on how businesses can approach social media strategically. And I think that's why it, that's one of the reasons why it resonated. The, yeah. the title wasn't bad, you know, so, yeah, of course. Um, you know, no bullshit social media was one of those that Barnes and Noble was like, we'll put that on an end cap. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it did, it did pretty well. And then the that's second awesome. book I wrote uh, with DJ Waldo was uh, an e a rebel's guide to email marketing. And that was really more DJ's area of expertise. I was mm -hmm. there to kind of help him write the book. Okay. It was also written with kind of an attitude. And I think that was part of what I brought you came in for. <laughs> that, that's awesome that you said that. Cause I actually was going to ask you, how's a social media person turn into like an email marketing person and writes a whole book on email marketing. Yeah. So that's interesting. Well, and, and my whole background, you know, was, was in much more broad, you know, marketing PR. Uh, and so I've been, I've always been thought of as a social media guy, but I'm really more of a digital marketing guy. So sure. I do, yeah. yeah. I do the breadth of things as, as a lot of us do. Of course. Uh, but you get that label, you know, because you, you know, when you first become known to people, they remember that first impression. And I was, 
you know, I, that was the, the early days of social media and Twitter yeah. and nobody else was talking about it at the level I was at the time, at least not in this region. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of, you know, got known for it. But yeah. I no, that's a lot awesome. more than I, that though. And I imagine it also helps because even my own like speaking opportunities in career, people don't necessarily want the digital person who also does social media. They want the right. social media person to come and talk about social media. Right. right? So kind of makes it a bit easier there. Yeah. So for folks that are, you know, a lot of people want to speak. A lot of people want to write books. You were early in an industry that was just taking off, started speaking. How did the book deal come about? Well, I had, I'd actually had a false start uh, on a book deal. There was a, a gentleman who was well known in the space, kind of an established thought leader who was, uh, I think suffered from pretty severe ADD okay. and he had been trying to write a book for a year or two and had a couple of co-authors that had, you know, fizzled out on him or he didn't like or whatever. So I, you know, kind of signed on to be his co-author and basically do a lot of the legwork of the writing. And okay. then like many of the other co-authors before me, the, it just didn't work out. Um, I was producing, you know, a high volume of stuff and, it just didn't suit him. And so it sure. didn't work and that's fine. We're still friends and, and whatnot. Um, so I had been, you know, my name had been mentioned in publishing circles. So the acquisitions editors knew who I was from that deal. And they knew that I had something that I could write and that I had an expertise and, and whatnot. And so, and then one day my friend, Eric Deckers called me and said, you need to write a book about social media Mm. Um, you would be really good at it. And he had written a book with another friend of his about per, personal branding. And he said, I have the connections with a publisher and an editor and I've written a book. I know how to do it. I can help you. And yeah. I was like, okay, let's talk. And so we started the conversation and he introduced me to uh, Catherine Bull, rest in peace, um, uh, introduced me to her. Uh, she was an acquisitions editor at Pearson and um, we had a couple conversations, put together a proposal, and she loved the idea, and the rest is history. It just kind of kind of rolled from there. Yeah, amazing. Were you able to use some of the content that you created for the previous book in this book, or no? He the, the 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 author in question owned that content. That was part of our agreement, and that was fine. Um, sure. It, to be honest with you, it's it's like the the first guy helped me learn how to ride the bike, right? Yeah. And then the second guy, Eric taught me how to race. And then once I figured that out, it was like, okay, now I'm going to bring DJ along and help him figure out how to race. And now on my third book, which it's been a while since I've written for a lot of reasons, but the third, this book I'm writing by myself and I'm, I feel really good about it. The writing has been really good. It's been crisp. Yeah. The process has been fun. I've enjoyed it. So this is going to be a fun one. When is it set to come out? So it'll come out in early 2021, knock on wood. All right. um, you know, goodness knows with the world we're in, what's going to happen. But sure. um, that is the slated published date. And, and people don't all, always realize that, you know, when you're in the world of, of blogs and, and social networks and social media posts and whatnot, everything happens in a two hour news cycle. And whatever you think of writing about today is history tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, of course. The, the publishing cycle is still antiquated and slow. And part of that is because there are, you know, plans made to promote and market and use channels and retailers mm-hmm. like Barnes and Noble and whatnot. And you just can't do that fast. Yeah, it's just sense. not a fast medium. So I can't, you know, I had the book about probably a third written when we, uh, or maybe almost a halfway written when we actually, you know, signed a deal with Entrepreneur Press to, uh, to, to publish the book. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I've got it halfway written, so I can probably have it done in another month or two. Can we yeah. publish in the summer? And they're like, uh, no, no, this is yeah, be next yeah, year. yeah. I'm like, no, really? So, <laughs> but they've already sold, you know, their, the titles that they distribute through their channels. They've already sold the fall catalog. Wow. Okay. So you can't, I can't even make it into a catalog until January 2021. But that's okay. It's just giving me more time to think think more deeply about the book and do a better job with it and take my time with it. So it's been good. Yeah, that's amazing. So I think. I'll make it a two-part question. I guess you say things change so fast, right? So I guess the first thing someone would think is like, why write a book on influencer marketing, <laughs> right? Um, which that's my, that's maybe I, I said in the wrong order, but like, I guess my first question is, is no bullshit do you think is still applicable today? So the book, No Bullshit Social Media is still applicable today because Eric and I intentionally wrote it from a sort of an agnostic point of view. 
And I think we pointed out a couple of times in there, hey, today we're talking about Twitter and Facebook, but there's going to be something different that comes yeah. along. You know, and that was right when Instagram had launched, but it wasn't big yet. Snapchat wasn't even a thing no, back no. then. We were still talking about clout scores and, and crap oh, wow. you know, that it doesn't even exist anymore. Yeah. Um, the kids so, don't know about that. No, they don't. It's, it's really funny. Um, and you meant microblogging, not Twitter, right? Exactly. Microblogging. Yeah. And back then we called it blogger outreach. Now they call it influencer marketing. Yeah. So there were so many things that changed over the years, but we wrote it from not the perspective of here's how to use social media, but here's how to apply marketing strategy to social Smart. media thinking. Yeah. Right. And so it was, what can insert channel here, social media or drill it down to Twitter, Facebook, what can yeah. it do for your business? What do you want it to do for your business? And then how do you think about that, um, that strategy that you're that that goal that you're trying to achieve through these different channels and so you yeah. can apply the same thinking to snapchat and yeah. and what Marco the polo is the new thing now apparently marco polo is the big thing now but um or the new big thing but you can you can channel all of those strategic thinking ideas through just about any platform social or otherwise so Makes it sense. still stands up and we we actually ironically enough we still i mean the book is nine years old and we still sell, uh, you know, like two or three digital copies a month. And, oh, wow. you know, I'll, I'll get a royalty statement every quarter and, and look at it and go, people are still buying this? Are yeah, wow. I, I, I joked the other day, uh, someone said, do, so do you still look at your royalty statements? And I said, here's what a royalty statement is. A royalty statement is 77 sheets of paper sent to you every month or every quarter. And the summary of the 77 sheets is we ain't paying you nothing else. That's what it is. That's hilarious. <laughs> or even if you got paid, the, the paper will be worth more than what you're getting paid. <laughs> exactly. Here's your 25 cents. And we spend $5 to mail this and $10 to print it. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, you, I will say this. If anybody out there is ever interested in writing a book, Mm -hmm. That's great. And I encourage you to do it. It's a lot of fun. It's very fulfilling, but you are not writing a book for the money. Yeah. Um, and you're not going to get money from the book. Now you can get money from being an author, being a thought leader, being asked to be interviewed on TV and things like that. You can certainly get paid to speak at conferences because you bring an area of expertise and mm -hmm. you're a published author. And there's a process to publishing, which actually makes it a little bit more legit than a blog and whatnot. Sure, yeah. Several Makes editors sense. go through it and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So there's some credibility that comes with it there and you can, um, you know, get clients and uh, get paid speaking gigs and consulting gigs and whatnot out mm -hmm. of being an author, but you're not publishing a book to make to royalties make off of copy sold. Yeah. You're yeah, going to get sense. an advance on your royalties and it's, it's literally a loan against your royalties. You don't have to pay it back normally if you don't sell enough copies, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're going to get a one-time fee, which is, not enough to cover the hours you're going to spend you sure. know, writing it for whatever your hourly rate is. Um, and you might get a royalty check or two along the way, but they're going to be a couple hundred bucks. It's not going to be a whole lot of money. Yeah. yeah unless you, how you're unless you go crazy and you know, you're a New York times bestseller and you sell 50,000 copies of a book. Well then you, then you're talking sure. about you get some money out of it. So. Yeah. That's a different, that's a different story, but very few people are going that famous or that big on digital marketing books, I guess, in general, unless you're a Gary Vaynerchuk of the world or. Yeah. And, and really Gary V's books, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call them digital marketing books either. I think they're more motivational books, you know, yeah, crush sure. it is, is applies across a bunch of different verticals. It's not really about social. He uses social media and his experience and expertise there to illustrate the point, but he's, he's a motivational speaker within the marketing yeah. context. That's what couldn't agree is. more. And he's great at it. And yeah, he, he's fantastic. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want anybody else in that role because he's really, really, really good at it. Yeah, but his good books, old Jersey boy. I yeah, I wouldn't call them social media books. I'd call them motivational books. Yeah, that's fair, hundred percent. So I guess you you touched. So I just let me ask you the second part of the question is, uh, uh, if you write an influencer marketing book, are you applying the same kind of? <laughs> methodology where you're making it so that it applies 20, 30 years from now, or? I, I am actually. Now there's a lot of practical, here's how you, uh, it's the same kind of construct of social, of no bullshit social media in that here's how you approach influencer marketing strategically. Here's how you build campaigns. And um, the reason that it is uh, that I can say with confidence that I'm writing it from that filter of, I want this to be, uh, evergreen and agnostic and so on and so forth is because my purpose in writing this book is really to make the point 
that the term influencer has tainted our uh, opinion and thinking when it comes to influence, right? Interesting. So you'll notice in the title of the book, the title of the book is called Winfluence. Um, <laughs> and, and the subtitle is something like uh, the, uh, the, 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 the powerful, the ultimate guide to powerful influence marketing, mm -hmm. but it's not powerful influencer marketing because I think I got that it. word has tainted what, how we think influencer yeah, in a lot of people's minds means people on Instagram and YouTube, peace signs and duck lips. Sure. Um, but to be an influence marketer, that's what we all are. We're all trying to wield influence yeah. over either our audience or prospective audience members or the channels which we go through to reach them. And so it doesn't matter if you've got a big Instagram following or you are the president of the local PTA, you have an audience that you influence. We're all mm. influencers to a degree. Um, and so my argument is we have to think of influence marketing at a high level. Influencers online are part of that, but so are lots of other people that we Amazing. also need to plug into our equations. That's good. So who do you say the book is for? Is it specifically for people in marketing, CEOs, HR? I, I'm writing it for the, the marketer. And that could be a brand marketer. It could be someone at an agency. Mm -hmm. It could be a business owner. It could be a small business owner. It could be the CEO of a large company. They have to influence. Yeah. I, I'm basically, I'm just saying, look, anybody who's interested in marketing, you have to use influence marketing in some form or fashion. Makes and so sense. let's drill into it a little bit and say, here's how you approach that strategically for your business. Yeah. It makes sense. Hmm. I, we could talk about influencer marketing <laughs> all day long. It could be a whole podcast. I want to get back mm -hmm. to something you said earlier too, about writing a book. Like you say, you don't recommend it. Right. And it takes a lot of time. Now the first book you wrote was in 2012. You had a full-time job, right? Yep. Probably speaking at the same time. Besides, I was, I was speaking a little bit, but not, I wasn't like making money as a speaker then. Got it. I was just doing new business for Doe and mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. So Doe was the agency. Yeah. Doe Anderson, uh, they are one of the oldest uh, ad agencies in the United States. Oh, wow. um, they've been the agency of record for Makers Mark Bourbon for over 45 years now, wow. almost 50 years. Um, and so very storied, uh, well reputationed ad agency in Louisville. Good folks. So that's amazing. So was Doe ever upset or did it ever come into question your loyalty to Doe in the fact that you're writing this book and you're not necessarily writing the book, you know, on behalf of Doe or you're not necessarily out there speaking, though the speaking helped you win business. Sure. No, it, and that, that made it, you know, that made it fine. Um, you know, my, the CEO, when I got there, Dave Wilkins retired while I was there and then Todd Spencer took over. He's Todd, Todd's still the CEO today. And they had the attitude that, look, the more Jason gets out there and talks about this stuff, the more, you know, we can claim expertise in it and we can attract clients. We have Jason. And even, even when I left, I, I kind of left to go out on my own. Um, and, um, and even when I left, they were like, okay, well, we appreciate you like helping us establish a reputation in that. Because when I left, I left behind a couple of uh, social media managers and a real you know, sort of discipline at the agency. Mm. And they, to this day, have a well-staffed, you know, social content and, and social media uh, marketing effort and do a great job for their clients. So, um, you know, I feel, I feel good that I helped build something there. Um, mm -hmm. And then I went on to do other things and they have kept that and grown it and, and probably been even more successful without me than they ever were or could have been with me. So um, they're good. They're smart people and they're going to take something like that and, and ride that train that's as amazing. long as they can. And they're still doing it. Doing yeah, as they job. should. That's amazing. That's, that's yeah. smart. I mean, that's, that's a great company right there. Did you, so you went off to become your entrepreneur, you started your own agency or. Yeah. So I started it, originally, it was just social media Explorer. It was the blog that I started years sure. ago that most people know me for. And it, it, it became at that point in two, th summer 2009, it became a, a consultancy. Um, and so it was just me for about a year and a half. And then I realized I could probably drive more revenue if I had more help and, um, uh, you know, and price things a little differently. So I expanded, uh, brought in a business partner, uh, brought in, uh, you know, a social media operations community manager person. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, um, I brought in another business partner, Nicole Kelly, and we basically formed Social Media Explorer into a, 
a full, you know, digital agency. Um, and, you know, she was really, you know, growing and nurturing the agency side of the business. And I was growing the content side mm -hmm. of the business. We did our own series of events back then around the country, um, doing lots of virtual events as well, you know, trying to put out an educational product, which, wow. you know, kind of flattered and, or, you know, fumbled around and failed. Yeah. But, you know, I was trying to build content products and she was trying to build the consulting part of the business. When Cafe Press came along in uh, 2013 um, and, and wanted to talk to me about helping them, I was like, okay, let me bring my business partner to the table and we'll have a conversation. And Bob Marino, the CEO at the time said, I don't want to talk to your business partner. I want to hire you. And I'm like, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, on, I'm, I have my own business. So yeah, that's I, my job. Do that? Yeah. And so we, let, let's just say we had a conversation where he convinced me that I needed to come to Cafe Press. Wow. And, um, and so I basically sold um, Social Media Explorer to Nicole mm -hmm. and went, went to Cafe Press and was there for a couple of years and, and, um, and helped, helped them basically put out uh, a lot of fires in their internal designer community at the time. That was mm -hmm. what I was kind of charged with at, uh, from the onset. But I really enjoyed getting to know the e-commerce world and Cafe Press is custom products. So, you know, put your own design on yeah. T-shirts and mouse pads and stuff like that. Um, and they also um, owned an art division called Canvas on Demand. So if you see the art canvas hanging over my shoulder, if you're watching the video, yep. um, you know, that's a, a, a picture that I took of my daughter in a play and it's on an art canvas. Mm -hmm. And so I have those hanging all over my house. That was one of our divisions as well. And uh, I really learned a lot about e-commerce and sort of the paid side of the aisle that I didn't really know mm -hmm. while, while also sort of shepherding them along with organic content, social content, things like that, and, and helping nurture their community of designers. So um, that was a really good challenge for me. And it was really eye opening and put me, you know, it put me in, in the boardroom of a publicly traded company. And yeah. Wow. Gave me a little bit more credibility than I had. So it was a, it was a fun ride. That's amazing. Yeah. You went, maybe just uh, not just a social media person anymore. Yeah. I think that probably broke that, you know, broke that open a little bit. And then when I left cafe press, Bob actually uh, retired. And so the original founders came back and, and we were talking about, you know, the, the vision of the business at that point. And it just seemed like the right time. You know, they, I think they kind of wanted somebody different in my okay. role. Okay. Um, and it wasn't a, a bad thing. It was just like, okay, that I, I see yeah, where you're going and I, I maybe don't fit there as well as I, as I would otherwise. So I actually moved over to uh, the agency that I had had hired and brought in oh, wow. uh, as a PR firm um, at uh, Cafe Press and went there for a few years and, and, and helped them grow some of their business and, and do some good strategy work for them. And then wound up a few years later at Cornette and that's where I am now. It's amazing. Has this always pretty, pretty much from Doe to now, always in Kentucky? Uh well, yes and no. Um, the uh, the agents, I've always lived in Kentucky. I've lived here since 2006, uh, I mm -hmm. guess, when I, when I start, first started at Doe, uh, moved back from, I lived in Alabama for five years prior to that. I've lived here ever since. The agency that I left to join after Cafe Press was actually based in St. Louis, um, but I've always been here and actually you know, built a Louisville office for that agency for a couple of years. They don't have it anymore, but mm -hmm. while I was here, they did. So, and we had an employee, another employee here in town too at the time. That's awesome. Did you, so do you feel also that, uh, let's say the cafe press, do you feel like you would have been approached by cafe press if it wasn't for you making a name for yourself and kind of building yourself a little like inbound marketing engine for Jason? Yeah, no, no way. Absolutely. No way. I would have been, you know, just some other, you know, schlep at an agency, you know, pitching clients, they would never would have known who I was. If, if it weren't for the fact that I built a, a personal brand and I, you know, there's a couple of people out there that kind of roll their eyes at the whole personal branding thing. Yeah. But if I had not established myself as a thought leader in the business, whether it was an extension of dough or not, yeah. um, uh, Joe Schmidt, who ran Canvas on Demand, the art division at, uh, Cafe Press at the time would never have heard my name, never have known who I was. And he was the first guy who approached me and said, I think you need to meet Bob because Bob's looking to do a few things. And I think you'd be really helpful. And if I hadn't have been known, if I hadn't have been an author, yeah. um, nah, they probably never right. would have known who I was and, and never would have called. It makes sense. I used to be one of those folks that would uh, hate on people on the personal branding side. <laughs> and it's, I don't have, I can't call it a regret, but I do wish that I actually would have started that much sooner. 
You know, I, and, and to be honest with you, I've, I've heard that from a lot of people and um, there's a lot of things that I look back on and say, Oh, I was trying to play around with that back in 2007. Yeah. I wish I had stuck with it or I wish yeah, I had yeah. done that a little differently. You know, I, I always look back and think, God, I missed so many opportunities. Yeah. Um, but I hear you. I, I definitely hear you. And I've had more than one person tell me, Hey, I'm working on my personal brand. And I'm like, well, I've known you for 10 years. I'm like, yeah, but I've, I don't have a blog. I haven't done anything yeah. that sets me apart from other people. And it's, it's a viable path to, you know, putting yourself in a better position down the road. That's for agreed. Sure. Yeah, I know. I couldn't agree more. Even on like my Oreo days, I didn't have a Twitter account really. Like mm. I had a Twitter account. You could find me yeah. on Twitter. The last time I tweeted was probably two years. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you were, you were in, in those days, you were one of those guys that I had a lot of respect for because you were focused on doing good work for your clients. Not yeah. that I wasn't, yeah. but I was spending an inordinate amount of my, you know, my, my 40 hours a week or 50 hours or whatever it was, was spent on my clients and working hard for them. I was working overtime on me. Sure. That yeah. was the nights yeah. and the weekends and the staying up till two in the morning to finish this new design of a blog or whatever. Yeah. Um, all that time that I spent on me was overtime. That was extra time. But I had a lot of respect for people like you. Thank you. Um, and there was another, another gentleman that's a great example of, of that too, was a guy named Constantine Basturia. And uh, he worked uh, or maybe still does work at, uh, at Conversion in okay. uh, New York City. Constantine was one of the top probably five or 10 PR bloggers in the world wow. in 2007. And then in September of 2008, he, he wrote a blog post and we never heard from him again in that world. Sure. Cause he was like, man, I got clients. I'm busy. Yeah, I, yeah, focus yeah, I, this work. I got work to do. It's, it's, I got a family and this is taking up too much of my time. Yeah. I had a world of respect for people like him and people like you, because you were really focused on sure. where you. you should be focused on, you know, for your primary, this is how I make money. I just happened to be in a situation where, and, and I'll be, I'll admit that my family suffered a little bit. Sure. Um, and, and I sacrificed some things back then that I probably shouldn't have. Um, but it wasn't an ego thing for me. It was, I'm trying to build something bigger and better down the road. Yeah. And if I had not done that, things like cafe press wouldn't have come along, which, you know, provided for my family. for a few Yeah, years. no, that, that makes, that makes a hundred percent total sense. Are you feeling that now a tiny bit though? Now you're writing and I know anybody who follows you on Twitter, you're you're, you're pretty much tweeting, finished another 2000 word, I don't know, chapter. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's definitely a little midnight oil burning going on here. Um, but, it, I'm, but I'm in a much better place. Well, I'm in a better place. I'm in a worse place. It depends on how you look at it. Uh, the, the culmination of, of sacrifices that I made over the years, unfortunately led to me getting a divorce. So I'm not married anymore. Um, and I've got two wonderful kids and my ex-wife and I get along great. and We co-parent very well. So all that's good. Uh, but half of the time I've got a lot of extra time on my hands. Sure. Um, especially now that I can't go anywhere. I mean, I have a girlfriend, but I haven't seen her in a month. And wow. so instead of spending, you know, evenings with her, I'm spending evenings writing and researching for my book and whatnot. So now I have, uh, the ability to manage my time a little bit better. And so I'm getting a much more much more fulfillment out of this particular process. Plus, you know, it's, you know, nine years ago, um, uh, I was writing a book because I thought it'd be a cool idea and it would help me sort of move my way up the ladder. Now I'm writing a book because I really want to share the information that I know about this topic and I really want to help people. Yeah, support it. other people. Not that that wasn't a motivation uh, back then, but now I don't, I don't, I don't care if I get invited to speak at a conference. I don't care if I make a lot of money from this book. I'm doing it to help people who I know are having trouble with this topic. And I yeah. happen to do it every day. So it's something that's easy to share and having your name on the spine of a book in Barnes and Noble is yeah. cool. I, yeah. I think that's uh, a neat accomplishment. So I'm doing heck it. Heck yeah. No, it's, it's on my personal list of things to do. I would love to have a book. I don't think there's anything like walking into a Barnes and Noble, a legit store and seeing your name on it. And be like, hey, the, fir the first time it happened to me, I was, I, I got, I got the chills. I really did. Yeah, I bet. I bet. I was by myself. That's the only thing I regret. I wish I'd taken my family with me. Now I later, you know, drug my, let's see, that was 2009. So uh, I drug my four year old kid uh, and, and my infant daughter <laughs> <laughs> and my wife at the up. time to Barnes and Noble said, look at that book. Yeah. My name's on, you know, but I, the first time I went in to my local Barnes and Noble, I was by myself and I walked over and they had three copies of it. Uh, and it was actually on an end cap because it had just come out. 
and mm. uh, it looked good. And I was like, Oh my God, that's and the funny. sales, the sales guy, you know, one of the people came over and said, can I help you find something? I said, no, nah, I found it. I said, see that book right there. Said, uh-huh. I wrote that book. Oh, that's awesome. Like, Are you kidding me? And so he did the, do you want to do the author signed copy? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah man. Bring out the stickers. I'm yeah. going crazy. <laughs> It was Next cool. time you got to have a picture of yourself on it. So be like, see that guy? Yeah, that's me. That's, that's me. me right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cool, it's a cool feeling. It, it's that definitely, is. it's definitely a, a little bit of an ego trip and a personal, va- personal vanity thing, mm. but, but it's also oh, neat to be yeah. able to, you know, go home for Thanksgiving and hand your mom your book. Yeah. I agree. I mean, to I be able to, agree more. to send a, send a signed copy to your sophomore English teacher who used to rip your essays sure. apart and say, yeah. you actually helped me. Yeah. Here's, here's a copy of my book. That's a cool thing. No, that's amazing. I, yeah, I can't imagine there's any other feeling like it. Now with this whole coronavirus thing happening, and I actually just saw a study today that said like social distancing could be in effect until like 2022 or something. Are there talks internally or even just circulating in your mind? Is like, this is going to be an ebook? Is this going to be something that we postpone? <laughs> is this going to be an audio book now that you're going to have to read? Like, you're not well, even thinking about that. I, I'm not. I'm not really thinking about that because you know books can be bought in multiple ways, online, offline, etc. Mm. So even if we never have another opportunity to sell books retail, they're still going to sell. Sure. And people are still going to want a hard copy that they hold in their hand. So yeah, there's going to be an ebook or a Kindle version. Yeah, there's going to be a hard uh, bound version. Uh, and yeah, there's going to be an audio book that was part of the, the negotiation amazing. with the publisher. And if I'm, if I'm lucky, I have to audition. A I've, I've heard that lucky, before. Yeah. I, I heard someone else. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, I'm a, I'm an old radio broadcaster. So uh, I have a feeling I'm going to pass the audition. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be fine. Plus you doing <laughs> it is going to, no one else is going to do it justice. Yeah. And, and that's the one thing, the one, the one advantage in being from, from Eastern Kentucky, I do have that twang yeah. that I'm sure most of your, your listeners can, can, can pick up on. Um, people around here think you talk so city, you know, Oh, really? Um, <laughs> well, you should hear my brother. Now my, my brother who is not, you know, a trained broadcaster, mm. um, you know, kind of talks like Boomauer from King of the Hills. Or yeah. 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 Wow. Um, he, he's not that bad. I love my brother to death, but, um, but yeah, back home, I sound like I'm from the city, like I'm from New York city, uh, to wow. them. Uh, but to people in New York city, I sound like, you know, Jed Clampett, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the good things that, that one of the benefits of being from, from Eastern Kentucky for me now mm-hmm. that I'm speaking and that people know who I am and that I'm invited on podcasts is that Southern twang is cute and it's identifiable and people like yeah. it. Now, when I was a 23 year old intern at ABC radio in New York, it worked against me because everybody there thought I'm stupid. Yeah. Um, so it goes both ways, but you know, in my, in my older years, uh, it's, it's certainly turned out to be an advantage. No, I think it'd be amazing. I, I mean, I feel like you have to do it. Maybe <laughs> we can start a petition if, if you don't get it, but I'm sure you're going to get it regardless, but yeah, well, I'm going to raise hell if I don't. So yeah, of course. We'll, and I'm going to make fun of whoever does it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, uh, you also said you got to, you know, you started speaking, not everyone gets paid to speak. Did you, right. how, how soon, after you started speaking, did you actually have an opportunity to get paid for it? Yeah. So the first time that I, the first time that I got paid to speak, um, I basically said, look, um, I can come and speak at your event, but I don't have a travel budget. So yeah. could, could you make sure that you cover my flight in my hotel? And I was nervous about asking for that at the time. I didn't know any better. Yeah. Um, and, and they said, oh yeah, sure. No problem. We'll cover your flight in hotel. No problem. We'll make sure you get fed while you're here and all that good stuff. Yeah. So no, no problem. And so I did that for, you know, two, three, four events. And then I thought, okay, well, let's try this. So I don't have a travel budget and you're taking me away from, you know, my, my, my day job. So yeah, yeah. do you have like an honorarium or some budget where you could give me a little fee? Yeah, they and I, I think I, I think the first time I asked for 500 bucks. Yeah. And they're like, sure, no problem. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then a few months later, I asked for a thousand. And then a few months later, I asked yeah. for 1500. And so I did that for about three years. And then I started writing the book and a couple of my friends in the industry said, as soon as that book comes out, you, you double your speaking rate. Yeah. It makes sense. Um, and said, and, and you can get away with about 2,500, three grand hmm. if you don't have a book, but you can't get away with much more than that if you, if, if, if you don't. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I remember, so I've only really been speaking in 
for two years and only really made it part of like my overall income in the past like year and a half or so. Right. I used to just, they paid for me to travel. And I remember the first time I got paid, they were like, all I have to give you is this. And I'm like, but that's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I, I mean, even only have two grand. Holy shit. Yeah, okay. I'm like, wait, what? that's all you have? I'm like, yeah. I didn't even ask for money. I think this is, if you would have given me pizza <laughs> paid for my flight, yeah. I would have been like, this is fantastic. I'm doing great in life. Yeah. And it, it's funny, almost like what you're talking about having a book and seeing it on the shelf and being able to tell your mom about it and mm -hmm. being able to tell your family and friends. I, I remember calling up my grandparents and being like, someone's actually going to pay me this really just dumb amount of money for yeah. me to speak for like 45 minutes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm probably the luckiest person ever. Uh, oh like, yeah. <laughs> but now, but now here, and, and I was right, I've been there right there with you, but I also was talking to um, someone, it might've been Chris Brogan, somebody like that in the, in the business yeah. one time about getting paid to speak. And I was like, I just, I don't know, you know, I feel bad asking for more than X or Y. And yeah. they said, don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. Because you got to think if you go to an event where they're, let's say they're going to pay you a thousand dollars to speak. If they pay you a thousand dollars to speak and there's 300 people in the room, those 300 people might've paid a thousand dollars each to be there. Yeah, that's true. That's 300 grand. They're paying you one. You're going to be okay. Yeah. And you're helping put butts in the seats. You're the content. No, you're right. And so you deserve to be paid for your work and your time and your expertise. So don't ever underestimate your value. And that was, you know, sage advice back then. Now there's plenty of conferences out there that have a policy of we, you are getting paid with exposure to our audience. Yeah. We're not going to pay you. And I've taken a pretty hard stance with a couple of those over the years and said, well, I'm not going to speak at your event. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah. I, think I would love to, but I can't do it for free. My time and yep. my time away from my clients That's is worth more than, uh, you know, than, than nothing. Uh, yeah. Than no, a plane ticket. Everything you said before resonated with me, but that resonated the most. Yeah. Like I'm taking time away from my <laughs> clients, yeah. my ability can, to make money. I, you know, I can come to your three day event for nothing. And maybe even I've had some of them say, you got to pay your own way. Oh, I no, can that's, come, that's I ridiculous. can pay my own money to come and speak at your event and help you make money. And meanwhile, I'm leaving, you know, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars worth of hours that I could charge a day with yeah. my clients back home. No, thank you. I'm not going to. Yeah. No, I don't blame you at all. Fortunately, I've never run into that. Uh, they've always kind of covered and given me a little bit above my yeah. travel eating. Well, and you also, you also have to remember too, that it, it always depends because I can't take a hard line of, I will never speak for free because sure. I got to, I got to pimp a book, man. No, you know? of course. I got to get out there and sell this book. And so if I have the opportunity to get in front of two or 3000 people and, and, you know, I might say, Hey, of course, why don't you order a couple hundred books from yeah. my publisher wholesale so that I can sign. So now I'm making money sort of indirectly, Yeah, it makes but, sense. but I'm helping my books. So you, you, you kind of have to balance. There's one of, one of the conferences that um, uh, changed its policy kind of midstream, not midstream, but they, they paid speakers for the first three or four years of the event. And then they came out one year and said, we're not paying speakers anymore. Mm. But the first event they had, let's say, 1,200 people at. By the time they said, we're not paying speakers anymore, they had 25,000 people at the damn thing. So at, at some point, you get to a size where, A, if they have to pay every speaker a couple grand each, it yeah. is going to hurt them financially. Makes sense. And B, you are getting exposure to enough people that you can make it worth your while if you know what you're doing. Yeah, it makes sense. No, that's, that's a great example. Uh, the, the thing right now that I'm also seeing is a lot of the people that I do see them keynoting and maybe I'm going to sound like a complete jerk here. I'm like, they paid that person. <laughs> like, I know it's going to come off as pandering, but I'm not like you tell a story, <laughs> you're entertaining, you're funny, you're cursing, you know, you got that sweet Southern charm. Like now I'm pandering. No, but, um, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I've seen people up there with just lies, you know, like the. Yeah. And I'm like, what's going on right now? Who's who's gonna? Yeah, do? or well, the people, the person that quotes themselves. Yeah, those are those are those <laughs> are obnoxious. Um, so there's it's it's kind of funny because I I have I've had those personal criticisms of other speakers over the years, and 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 I've tried to 
I try not to openly criticize others because everybody's yeah. got their own thing, their own style, yeah. their own. Experience. I can be criticized for a million things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And people, I mean, I I can't tell you how many people have said I'll never hire Jason Falls to speak because he swears. Yeah. And they have a thing with you know I will openly swear on stage. Yeah. I don't. I I I do it just because it's a natural exclamation point or underline for what I'm saying. I know exactly what I'm saying and why yeah. I'm saying it. You know, I don't just I don't swear to swear. Yeah. I have been on stage with speakers who swear to swear. Sure. And you can tell the difference. Yes. Um, but I, I, I generally, when I see someone who I'm like, Oh gosh, this is painful. I don't want to watch them. I try to remember that not every audience member is me. Not that's, every audience wow. member has the same experience I have. Right. Um, they, they are learning some of this stuff for the first time. So as dry or as dull as I may think it is, it might be amazing no, you're to right. half the people yeah. sitting in the room. No, you're right. So you got to kind of take that, that into consideration. Yeah. And, and not everybody's an entertainer, you know? That's true. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good example of someone who won't get mad at me for using them as an example. <laughs> um, I, okay, I'll go out on a limb. John Jantz, Duct Tape Marketing, mm-hmm. not an entertainer. Yeah. But freaking great on stage because yeah. no, he's fair. so full of knowledge that's fair but he's not going to get up there and tell jokes and he's not going to razzle dazzle and you know he's not obnoxious or loud he's just straight by the book man yeah God, he's so good he's so no good. yeah he is yeah that's a fair point i mean i yeah i mean that's just the good way to look at life in general not everyone's looking at it through your <laughs> point of view right yeah and i and go then, up there i go up there half to make people laugh anyway so oh like, me too for me it's half comedy and half i'm going to give you some good information yeah and that's a good blend for me if i don't have that opportunity if i have to go up there and be in a box i'm just not gonna i'm not gonna like doing it agreed i think the last time we hung out in person was i was on stage yelling at you or you were yelling at me from the crowd yeah (laughs) Yeah. you remember my laser pointer yep yep (laughs) yep the laser pointers that was good i I still use that let me tell you people hate it but i love it yeah, that's funny. I'm like, I wait, do you, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And they're like, oh, yeah. I wasn't paying attention. Uh-huh. You're calling people out. That's a smart move. Like yeah. That. But I'm like, on the flip side, you could say like, you know, I've, and I've written speeches like this where they're funny and I've shown them to friends. They're like, you're basically doing stand-up. What's the point of this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, it just yeah. has like 50 jokes about yeah. influencer marketing. So here's the, here's the, the fun part. So I, I obviously got a reputation pretty quickly as being someone who was you know, tried to be funny. I don't know mm. if everybody thinks I'm funny. Obviously some people don't, but um, I got that reputation of being that kind of, you know, funny guy. And of course I was working with a bunch of spirits industry folks. So yeah. I was a guy who could prop up a bar and have a drink. So um, X beyond, uh, which was later acquired um, by Sysimos, which was later acqu- acquired by, Meltwater. Uh, uh, meltwater, right. Um, Remember, so, I was at Expion. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You are. So Peter Heffering, the CEO, uh, hires me, their first ever conference. Um, they started like on a Thursday night at like five o'clock. Yep. In Raleigh. And they, they had cocktails and they had dinner and then they had the opening keynote and I was the opening keynote after people had been at the bar for a couple hours. <laughs> so I walked out on stage and Peter was sitting, you know, at the circle table in the front. I walk out on stage after they introduced me and I walked over and I had been doing some consulting work for XBion. So I knew Peter pretty well. And I walked over and I kind of leaned over and said, Hey, Peter, you hired me to go on stage three hours after people started drinking. <laughs> this can't go wrong. And the place just lit up. And I, I, I basically did an hour of stand up. I'm not sure I talked about a single thing. That's awesome. There. That's great. Jokes. It was great. That's fantastic. No, you're right. I've seen it. I can't think of who it is. I forgot what big agency it was like one of the big holding groups, but um, they, they gave a speech. They were a keynote speaker. They weren't funny at all. But I was just like at the edge of my seat, like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like this person is amazing. I can put it in the show yeah. notes because I'll look it up, but I'm like, wow. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, and this, this may be who you're talking about. It may not be, but Peter Kim, uh, who I don't remember where he went now. He used to be with Lego once upon a time. Mm-hmm. He was with the Dodges group in Austin and started out. The first time I encountered Peter professionally was at Forrester. Mm. Um, and I, the first time I ever encountered Peter was at Kentucky governor scholars in 1990, by the Ooh, way, fancy. another, another Kentucky guy. Uh, but so Peter who is absolutely brilliant, 
Um, and he does have a good stage presence, but he's one of these guys who walks up and gives a presentation to share with you exclusive data. He doesn't have that, to see that. I, that I love that. He, I love. He's just going to throw shit at you that you've never seen before. Yeah. Like, oh my God, this is amazing. That's worth money. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When so. you're, yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned something interesting that I want to bring back up. You said perhaps when you're speaking somewhere and they can afford to pay a fee to buy a certain amount of your books. Yeah. Does that overall total go into like when you say we sold over 500,000 books? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the way that works typically is if, if you agree to come speak in, or, in exchange for some books, either you connect them directly with your publisher to buy from the publisher's allotment of wholesale books, or you send them to like uh, 800 or CEO reads or, got it. or sometimes Amazon and just say, you just got a bulk order from Amazon. Mm. And so all of those unit sales count. Um, Makes sense. When, when you say I've sold 10,000 copies of a book, you've sold 10,000 copies of a book, even sure. to conferences. And I'll be, and I'll, I'll tell you, so I'll give, I'll give you this little secret. I had as someone who ran events for a while, I once had to buy, um, I think it was 200 copies of a certain speaker's book. Mm. <laughs> I won't name the speaker mm -hmm. in order to get them to come and speak for free. It wasn't free because I had to buy these 200 copies. I bought them wholesale. So I, yep. I got a good deal. And I only had about 150 people in attendance at the event. So <laughs> I currently have six boxes. That's awesome. This, this Peckerhead's books in my that's, garage. That's awesome. And they've been there for three years. That's great. That is actually I'm gonna, great. I, every time I go to half price books, I take two or three copies that's, with me. So. I love that. That's, a, that's an awesome story. Like, what are you doing with so many books? What is this? I don't know, man. They're they're there, and and sometimes I'll throw a couple in my briefcase and give them away to clients and stuff. Yeah, they, they serve a purpose at some point, but I definitely have more than I need. And that book, he's now written one or two books since then, so I it, it, they're even out of circulation. That's these funny. Days, I think. How do you feel uh, speaking? How do you feel, or maybe you've already seen it? Speaking is going to change, you know, during coronavirus. Like everything's moving online, yeah. or people. Are they going to now be like, we don't have to pay you. You're literally turning on Zoom and <laughs> speaking. What are you talking about? Well, Obviously I mean, the time is still spent. Yeah, the, the market will dictate that because, you know, a lot of the people who get paid to speak also get paid to do webinars and stuff. Yeah. They don't get paid as much, obviously, because they're not having to take as much time away from family and work and whatnot. But um, I think you're just going to see a lot more virtual events, and uh, which means you're going to see a lot more people. Um, who don't normally get to speak because they can't travel from work or whatnot, um, or they, you know, just don't have an interest in being on stage. Mm. I think you're going to see a lot more people come to the table as speakers and as experts because it's going to be easier for them to participate. Yeah. Um, but I think the established folks, the ones uh, who are out there, are going to find a way to make their webinars uh, either themselves or they're going to be able to work with partners and clients to make webinars very exclusive so that they do deserve to get paid some money uh, to participate in things like that. The great thing about that is, is in the same amount of time that I could go to a, a three day conference, I can do three or four webinars and probably yeah, make more money that way than I would uh, going to speak at the one event. So yeah. for the people that, uh, that do it and do it well and deliver great value, um, they're going to still be able to, to monetize it. But I, I do think that the, the push toward more virtual events is going to open a lot more doors for a lot more people. And that can't be a bad thing in my opinion. Agreed. Agreed. I'm, I'm interested in seeing the numbers. I don't know. I haven't actually looked them up. Like are people attending these webinars or? Yeah. I mean, I, I, there's a guy um, on that I'm connected with on LinkedIn um, who, uh, you know, pitched me an idea to include in my book. And he had built uh, one of those, you know, sort of Michael Stelzner esque all day, yeah. webinar things where there's a new speaker every 30 minutes and you pay a fee to access oh, the platform. And he had like 350 people. Oh, wow. Who paid to, to participate in this event. That's a it lot. was focused on LinkedIn and sales on LinkedIn It was very specific. Yeah. Um, and that makes perfect sense. The more niche you are, the, the more people, well, not the more people you have interested, but the more you can sell it. Sure. Yeah. But he had a, a big enough event that there were several hundred people who were paying him a couple hundred bucks a head to be in this, in this virtual event. And even if he did pay every speaker a few hundred bucks to be in it, he made a buttload of money off it. Yeah, of course. I mean, even, even if he charged people a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I, the, the, there's a lot of people out there who have, who are content creators mm -hmm. 
who have been speaking at events, but have never done their own events who are going to now start doing virtual events and monetizing. Yeah. Interesting. It's easy to do and you don't have to charge people uh, an amount of money that they're, they're going to struggle with in order to be able to make some money. Doing yeah. It, no, that's, know? that's very well put. You I see mean, yourself doing do a, that at all? I could, yeah, probably. I mean, I could do a webinar on anything, you know, um, influencer marketing, for instance, next week, market it through a few channels and, you know, 25, 30 people will pay 10 yeah, bucks no. a head to come in. So yeah, that, that's not a big bottom line, but if I grew no, my list still. and all that kind of stuff, I could probably make some good money doing it. Yeah, no, I, I'm I, time. <laughs> I, I agree. Um, now you have a podcast, right? When did you start the podcast? Ooh, that's a great story here. Th- let me, let me tell you, the, let me tell you the story about the podcast. Let's go. It, there's, there's, it's a two part story. <laughs> so about, uh, five years ago, um, I said, okay, I'm an old radio guy. I love, you know, radio audio. Um, uh, I, I don't hear podcasts that I like. Mm. And the reason that I didn't, I, you have to understand when I was 24 years old, I was a network broadcast producer. Yeah. So I only worked with people who knew what the hell they were doing. Sure. And, and the audio product that we put out was the best audio products in the world at the mm. time. I mean, I was with ABC radio in New York. We were, yeah, you don't get better. We were cranking out high quality shit, you know, talk shows, news shows, et cetera. You don't make mistakes on the air. If you do you get fired, I mean, that kind of quality. So about five years ago, I'm like, I would be happy to listen to podcasts. If any of them had any level of quality at all, they're all a bunch <laughs> of amateurs and they'll suck. Yeah. So I started a podcast to uh, experiment with the technology, get to know how to do it. Um, you know, cause I could run a radio board and I could do a radio broadcast, but what happened to the audio signal after it left the microphone, I didn't fucking know what happened. Yeah. So I wanted to kind of teach myself podcasting. So I started this podcast called 100 proof, um, the badass radio show, mm-hmm. uh, with, with Tanya Doc, a friend of mine, and we would interview people we thought were badass. And I don't think we ever had more than 10 listeners, but, mm. um, but we had fun doing it. It lasted about a year, year and a half, something like that. And then I got, you know, diverted with one thing or another and got really busy and couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. So I gave it to Tanya and said, if you want it, take it. If you don't kill it, I don't care. Sure. So I went off and did my thing. Well, then shortly after uh, Facebook live became available a couple mm. years ago, um, I was, I had a chiropractor's appointment early in the morning on Tuesdays. And so I would go to the chiropractor and then I would get into the office at like eight o'clock and nobody really, you know, comes in till eight forty five nine. No, not so I'm agency. sitting there getting ready for my day. Well, one day I was just like, oh, this will be fun. I threw open Facebook Live and said, Hey guys, I'm just getting ready for my day. Here's what's happening in my week. What are y'all doing? Yeah. So I would go back and forth with these people on Facebook Live, just goofing off in the office. Um, and it was just wide open to anybody. So eventually I got a couple dozen people were watching me do this, and then a couple dozen more. And then all of a sudden I had 50, 60 people watching me get ready for my work day <laughs> on Tuesday mornings. Yeah. So I was like, screw it, man, let's make it a show. And so I made it a show and I only did Facebook live for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, then I switched last May. I think it was, I switched to LinkedIn live because I started thinking, well, if I'm going to do this, it should be for business purposes. I should be able to yeah. try to drive leads. I should be able to use this for Cornet. Yep. And so I moved over to LinkedIn because, you know, agencies are B2B and LinkedIn's a much more of a B2B, you know, business oriented place. So I made the shift to LinkedIn and, and literally a month or two later, I was like, well, why don't I rip out the audio and make it a podcast? Yeah. Awesome. So it was a li- Facebook live, then LinkedIn live, then a podcast. It's only actually been a podcast for about nine months. Wow. Um, and uh, we're already going into a phase because it is an extension of what I do at Cornet we're already going into a phase where we're going to probably rebrand the podcast, oh, and make it more than just right now. It's called the Jason falls show, a marketing yeah. podcast. So it's all about me and I don't want it to be all about me. I want it to be about my team and creativity and kind of our, our tagline sort of is we make creativity your business advantage. Mm-hmm. And so we're kind of rebranding the thought process behind the show, yeah. changing the guests a little bit, but really focusing more on creativity Amazing. and uh, and so we're already starting to pivot a little bit with it and make it bigger than it already is. Well, I think, correct me if I'm wrong though, but even calling your show a podcast is probably not correct. Like uh, I was fortunate and honored for you to invite me on it. You're there with uh, our friends over at Switcher Studio yeah. with people, whoever was watching it now, like you have a screen, you're like, Leo, we're going to go ready in like three, 
two, one, like switching through, <laughs> you're asking me questions and yeah. you're like switching through. Then my name comes up at the bottom. I'm like, yeah. what's going on here? Like, yeah. And, and I, I, yeah. I and I, I, it is, it, it's a live stream. Um, and, and switcher studio allows me to basically treat it like a television show. And so I've got a guest who comes on and you'll see, uh, the guest on one side, me on the yeah. other, and we're talking to each other. And then I can hit a button and the guest comes full screen and I disappear. And then I can switch back to me or I can switch back to the split screen and I can bring up graphics and it's got all sorts of other bells and whistles, but it's just me. I don't, nobody helps me produce the show. Yeah. So I'm sitting there with switcher studios, switcher unit, yeah. like a TV truck on an iPad. Yeah. And you know, the, 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 the twit, the, the video chat pump pumps in through, a private link. So you would dial in and we're on there together and you're a camera shot. I'm a camera shot. Yes. And then if I have any other iOS device on any other thing, like a, a slide or, you know, or shooting across the room, if I'm doing an event or something that comes up as another camera shot. Yeah. And so I'm the director and I can go camera one to camera three to camera one to camera. That's two. awesome. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. I love the, those guys out there. They were super nice. They actually got me a beta access to LinkedIn Good. live too. Yeah, man, the, the folks at Switcher, um, and Nick and his team are great people. And I met them when they first launched and it was two, two guys, I think originally. Hmm. And, um, and they were working at a video production company and they said, you know, we were, you know, we were looking at these clients who were paying, you know, thousands of dollars, um, in video production fees for people to come in and basically, you know, shoot their events. Uh, sales events, conferences, things like that, weddings, et cetera. And we thought there's got to be a way to make live video production happen on a device. Yeah. And so they essentially built a big expensive TV truck that would come and produce a live event in an iPad app or an iPhone app. It's amazing. It really is amazing. And they're right here in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, they're they are. Of those guys. That's, that's amazing. The first time I saw them was at an event. They had a bunch of cameras on folks. And I saw the iPads all lined up and they're like, what around? And I'm like, I just turned on. I'm like, what, what are you doing? What is it? Can I like, can I yeah. borrow that iPad? And I'm like playing around with it, messing up their stuff. Oh yeah. And of course the first thing I asked them, I'm like, can I just put my pre-recorded things on there? And then yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. so it's not live anymore. Oh yeah. That's not the and, point, Leo. Well, it isn't, but the, they originally started out literally as a, a video production unit yeah. on a, in, an, in an app. They weren't doing live streaming when they first started. The live streaming was just an extension that, you know, the, the advancing technology opened up for them. Sure. And so they, they, you can still use uh, Switcher Studio, uh, not necessarily for live production, but for recording your own sales events, your own meetings, your own weddings, your own whatever the hell you want to record. Mm -hmm. And then because you're using a switcher unit and multiple yeah, cameras, cool. you don't have to edit later. It just takes the editing out of it. You're doing the production live. I love that. I never thought about it that way because how many hours upon hours, probably thousands of hours, every individual has of content that from a wedding, from vacation, oh, yeah. from what, from an event, whatever, that's just sitting there. I know oh, I do. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and I go back to my wedding. This is oh, now we're talking a long time ago. <laughs> you might've been like not born. Um, <laughs> but when I got married, we, we had one, you know, VHS camera rolling on it and they set up in the wrong side of the church. So the only that person's sucks. face they got was the priest. They didn't get our faces. Oh man. It was like a <laughs> podcast. Yeah, it was kind of was. <laughs> and, but if we had had switcher studio back then, yeah. anybody with a cell phone, of course they didn't have smartphones back then. Either. Yeah but anybody with a cell phone could have been one of our camera angles and we could have gotten the wedding shot from That's funny. 20 different That's, people. Yeah. Would have been fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, no, great guys. Happy to be able to give them a, a shout out too. <laughs> Good people. Yeah, definitely. And um, so how many episodes do you have now? Oh man, I lost count. Um, I don't label them. Do you episodes. do it every Tuesday? Every Tuesday at like 8 a.m. on Eastern every, time? Yeah, every Tuesday, 8 a.m. Eastern, 5 a.m. Pacific. So if I have a West Coast guest on there, they're getting up at the butt crack of dawn and I, I thank them profusely. Yeah, um, I was in Denver when I, you had invited me on. Exactly. I was like just waking up. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's tough on people, I know, but it's the only time of day I can do it and get away with it. Yeah. No. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, we, I think I counted, I got up to about 60 episodes 
before I stopped labeling them as episode number whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I really just said, hey, this show's about X and it's yeah, it another sense. episode. So I'm probably at this point up to 110, 120, because that was about a year ago. Um, now, I've also added to the podcast, the, uh, just the audio feed of the podcast, not the, the live streaming. Uh, but if you subscribe to the podcast on like a regular podcast, audio podcast, um, on Fridays, I will do either here's my take on a subject, like an eight, 10 minute thing. Mm-hmm. Or I'll do interviews with people who can't do the live thing, or I get them at a conference or something. I'll interview them just audio and put that on as kind of a bonus. Yeah, so there's incentive awesome. for people to actually subscribe to the podcast. That's, that's really cool. One of the things that I know you talked to me earlier on, even I think before I even started my podcast, is because you do like the technical side of things. You were talking to me about like the different equipment. The, the first mistake I did actually, and I knew this going in, but I still did it. I bought cheap equipment. Yeah and didn't buy the lights and didn't buy this. And yeah. next thing you know, I'm like, shoot, I guess I got to spend another whatever, $200 to get yeah. the stuff I need. Yeah. And I went back and forth because remember now I'm going to, I was, I was brought up in my first real job from the time I was a teenager was I was a radio disc jockey and I worked yeah. as a radio producer for a long time. So I had this uh, bias toward professional audio equipment. So I, I bought this really expensive Marantz microphone and a, and a big, you know, a, a, an audio board and a compressor and all sorts of other things. And I kept getting radio interference with my mic cables. And it didn't matter how good of a mic cable I bought, I was still getting this country station wow. in Lexington where I, where I used to typically and still would typically do if we were going into the office would, would film and record the show. I was getting this country station bleed on the, on the mics. And so I, I broke down and said, I've got to get a USB mic. So I did some research and I went out and I got this, this wonderful, you know, blue rhino or whatever the hell it's called. Yeah. I forget. <laughs> the um, Yeti? Uh, blue Yeti. Yes. Blue yeah, Yeti. I have that too. Um, and so the, I, I got this and this mic for the, for computer operations operates a thousand times better and sounds a thousand times better than all that expensive audio equipment. Yeah. So even I being, you know, the equipment snob learned a lesson or two and had to spend more money than I should have. But I, the way I set up now here at the house um, is with the Blue Yeti microphone. And then I've got a couple of lamps in this room with yellow walls that I've got kind of reflecting off the yellow walls. So I've, the, this room is set up to, to do this okay day or night. Daytime, it's a little better because I've got a window here. Mm. But in the office, we have indirect track light. Oh, okay. in the ceilings so better. and so i actually have these big long yard sticks and i maneuver them oh, around awesome. before the show to like spotlight on me so it's like i'm on a, a tv set yeah and uh, and then when the show's over i turn them around because if they're on me all day i'll sweat like crazy yeah um and so that indirect track lighting is just in the room that i mean it's just perfect so, that's awesome i have this big big box light right there See, I need one for over here because I've got this desk lamp reflecting off my wall uh, to the front left. Mm. And then I've got a regular desk lamp at face height uh, off to my right. But this is the corner of the room and I've got a big credenza over here. So I got to figure out how to do that one better. But yeah, it looks okay. I'm all right. Yeah. They're so inexpensive now. I think mine was like 20, 30 bucks. Yeah. Well, and, I, and I've got the big, the big, uh, you know, um, uh, huge umbrella lights uh, okay, for yeah. photography. Yeah, because um, I've done You'll some be studio, sweating. studio photography stuff. I'm not breaking those things out for, <laughs> yeah, no. for a video podcast. I'll just use a lamp for that. <laughs> yeah. the, you want to know? Obviously, if you're watching it, you can only see. But you see this here? Oh yeah, you're not. You're not in front of wood. You got a nope. backdrop. Cool. Yep, that's awesome. It's so obviously in post. I'll, I'll cut it a bit on my end so you can't really see. I guess yeah. no one can really tell, but. You could tell. Like sometimes when I first get go on video, I'll iron it or steam it. <laughs> <laughs> see i i went the uh i went the cheap route when i bought mine and my backdrop is like the senior in high school olin mills you know gray cloud thing so you as soon as you see it like dude do you take high school senior pictures what is yeah. that you know. <laughs> like lasers in the back exactly it's weird that's awesome now you've got a good one there that's that's a that's almost as good as a fancy zoom background you know yeah no got, and I, you don't know what's the good. thing that i realized i've moved a couple of times in the three, three, three times in the past, like three years or so. 
it still looks I'm in the, like I'm in the same place. Yeah, that's that's a, that's the key to doing it. Yeah, yeah and I, that, truthfully, I didn't think about that beforehand. It's just like I'm like, oh wow, yeah, I could be anywhere and just roll this up. He's I could be in a hotel white right treated now. wood room that he's in. Ex- exactly, <laughs> beautiful. Uh, well, Jason, thank you so much for being on, man. Yeah, like, man, this is great. It's an honor to be on. I I love this format because I very few times I feel like people like yourself. And other folks don't actually have the opportunity to tell stories and be nuanced and yeah. just yeah, the longer stories. The, the longer format is a lot of fun. I don't know if I could tolerate myself talking that long <laughs> all the time. So I don't know if I would be good to host a long format, but I enjoy being on it. And, you know, this is like sitting in a bar, having a cocktail and just got shooting, shooting the shit. And this is my kind of thing. So this is fun, man. Thanks for having me. No, no, I appreciate it. I, I will ask you, we could end it now. We could try one thing that I just thought about. Okay. Completely impromptu. I think it would be game, but if not, it's fine. You know, I I started developing another show called Prove It Matters. Okay. And um, for those listening that may not know what it is, and just as a recap for you, I feel that there's not a lot of healthy debate in the world of marketing. Mm -hmm. It's a really positive thing, but most of the times you have people being each other's cheerleaders all the time. Right. But no one really asking important questions of devil's advocate. That's right. I remember remember this when you started this. Okay. I got you. I did one recording. Then I got crazy busy. I wasn't (laughs) able to do it. And the funny thing is, I remember I had the little, I have this little form that you fill out to be on it. I have like 20 something people that fill out the form. I bet. Yeah. I got to chase people down for this one. (laughs) Like, Hey, did you fill out the form? Hey, can you, Uh that one, I got like 20 something people. People started reaching out of nowhere. There was something like sale. I got to look these I guess it's bad on me, but I haven't even looked it up. But these people, um, like from Salesforce, like some major folks, and I'm like, shoot, like they have something gold here. I just never had the opportunity to do it. Sure. But I allow people to say anything they want, premise, right? Like, yep. how about we do influencer marketing? Okay. You say influencer marketing is important. Uh, and I basically turn on to be devil's advocate and a complete right. jerk. Okay. And you have two minutes to debate me. Okay. You want to do it? Sure, let's do it. All righty. Let's see if you can see it. Like, again, I haven't any plan for this, but I'll stop it now. So if you're just listening, obviously this is going to be the same, but I'm going to have a timer right now. Okay. I'm going to start it. All right. Let's do the cool, doing the premise of influencer marketing. That's fine. Good way to market. Sure. All right. So I'll, I'll say something and then I'll let you start and then I'll start leading. you. Okay. Ready? Yep. So here's the thing, Jason. Influencer marketing is crap. It sucks. You got a bunch of like 22 year olds that probably bought followers on the internet <laughs> now going to some brand and saying, you got to pay me all this money to do some fancy marketing debate me. All right. If those are the only people that you are uh, counting on for your influencer marketing, it does suck and you're going to lose your money and you're not going to convince your clients to do anything. But if you look at influence rather than influencers, if you look at people who actually have impact on the potential audience you want to reach and you tie in with them, then you're going to be successful. Um, And the reason that I know that is because hundreds of companies are, and Mm. there are great influencers out there like you Mm. and me Mm. who genuinely talk about products and services and companies and our audiences believe us. But I bought all my followers. I don't know what you're talking about. All my followers, all my listeners, everything on my podcast, completely fake. This is what I'm doing. You looked at some metrics and you thought I'd be fancy and good for your brands. Maybe I don't, have, or you're also telling me that if I have like two followers, I have quality followers. Is that what you're telling me now? Well, if you're admitting all that, then maybe you are not a great influencer. <laughs> maybe you're a piece of shit and I'm doing pretty well for myself. True, Here's, but I'm not the only piece of shit out there. That's, this is true. Here's how I know this works. Because in 2009, a company reached out to me and said, I uh-huh. want to use you. And okay. I, they used me and I did one post for them or with them and uh, General sure. Motors signed up the next week. Yeah, that's one story though. What about the thousands of people being around the world saying, again, they have all these followers. You know what? They have lifestyle influence. That's what they do. They're like yeah. pretty looking people on the internet that's selling packages of dog food or something. Again, if you pick the peace sign duck face influencers, you're going to lose. If you pick the ones with real influence, you're going to be fine. Sure. But there's no way for you to even tell that I have big followers or not. How do you know? Oh, there's plenty of software out there that can tell you that. Uh, Plenty, plenty. I don't know. I just still think that the good looking people are the ones that are the best influencers and the ones out there getting all the money. 
Well, I'm great and I'm ugly as shit. So you lose. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Well, obviously See, I'm a radio I guy. I knew to wait until two seconds and throw that line in there. Yeah. Then, then I have to shut up. Right. <laughs> obviously I, I agree with you. Um, influence is important as you mentioned and looking at influencers from like everything from uh, employee advocacy to different advocates and influencers like my mom, you know, so on and so on. I, yeah. It's an important thing. And I look forward to, to having your book. Hopefully maybe we could give one away. Oh yeah, absolutely. Signs. Um, absolutely. I will, I will sell sign and give away a handful of, I won't give away them all. I got to make some money <laughs> or my publisher has to make some money, but yeah, no, we'll definitely get you some books and, uh, and have a good time with that when it comes out. Well, I love it. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate this. I love talking to Leo Morehorn. <laughs> Peace. Later, bro. Thank you.